Yeah. All right. I think I'll save this one. It is live, yeah. <laughs> but there's no one on it. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's, I don't know if this, this is the kind of time of day. I think yesterday, or day before yesterday, it was 39 on. But to today we have a nobody. Not well, three people, just... <laughs> Just come on. Hey guys, how's it going? Doing a little saddle stitching of the uh, the Lizzie handbag, the final part. Finishing up on the course now. So I thought I can't jump on and say hello. Tiago says, good afternoon. It is the afternoon here in the UK. Good afternoon to you too. If you want, I'm going to turn the heating on. So working on finishing up the stitching. I still have the edge finishing to do on the handbag. And the last part is installing the hardware. So that's what we are working on today. Final day of completion. Caught on there. Just keeping it between two pattern weights so it's nice and still and it can't move even if it wanted to. Any questions, guys, feel free to ask away. It's just me stitching away with a little coffee. Cheers. So a little bit of an awkward part, I'm stitching the, the flap of the bag at the moment. So a little challenging to get to with the uh, gusset being in the way. And several arm spans of thread going around. Stitching with uh, Fidu Chinois 632. So this is burgundy thread, same as the exterior of the bag. So it's a, a tonal thread, a matching thread on this. A few people have asked me about that actually. Um, why I like using tonal thread so that it matches. I actually have a blog, uh, leathercraftmasterclass.com, go to the blog and there's a, a guide on color matching for Leathercraft. Because um, I remember kind of searching for that years ago and I couldn't find anything on it. There's lots of articles for the fashion industry and things like that. Um, but I was always fascinated with, with color matching for leather goods because it's not quite the same as fashion and outfits and that kind of thing. So if you're interested in uh, finding a bit more information about it, it does go in, in depth, but it does summarize how to use it quite easily in a simple way. Uh, do, 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 do. Hello, any chance that you'll be adding uh, the possibility of buying single tutorials? We did do in the in the past. The difficulty with the website provider I'm working with is it, that's not what well, is technically possible, but it's uh, very, very difficult to have multiple videos on one page and it takes forever to load. And, you know, it was an absolute nightmare. So right now, everything is on one channel and, the, and that's what you purchase the entire channel. Um, so as of right now, it's only available as uh, a six month or a one year plan. So no individual courses at the current time, I'm afraid. But thank you for asking. Make sure I don't get caught on that handle, which is quite easy to do. all the way through the lining there, so we need a different awl. Yeah, no problem. Uh, Tiago says, when you uh, design a bag, to uh, do you take into consideration the amount of thread you need to stitch the panels together? Uh, do I consider it? Only if I'm running low, probably. <laughs> then I'll consider it. I'll make sure I've got enough uh, for a start. 
Uh, but are you, are you referencing the amount of time that it's going to take you, the amount of hand stitching that you have to do? Is that what you mean? Because I would certainly consider it if I was going to make multiple versions of the same thing. Because then you'd also want to factor your time into, uh, into your pricing. But that's if you're creating leather goods to sell, of course, isn't it? So stitching this in, coming up to the gusset now. And I'll be edge finishing last. So that'll be my, my final finish. We do the edges after this. And the whole bag takes, I mean, it's not a large bag, but it takes two long pieces of thread to do the entire perimeter. So it's not too bad, actually. I think uh, by contrast on my, was it the last course that I did? Or the course before that it was, of course, before that, that was the uh, the Cutler briefcase. I think that took about four, four arm spans of, of thread to go around the exterior. This isn't too bad being a smaller one. Uh, what I mean is that some bags will take more than five meters of thread and it ends up on the floor. Oh, OK, no. Um, so what I do is I, I transition them. So uh, it's a little difficult to explain, but I I transition one piece to the other without it being noticeable. So I finish a length of thread and then start a brand new one that's usually already in the hole that the first one finishes on. And that way, when it's finished, it's still strong, but you can't tell where it transitioned. That way, um, I'm never using more than one or one and a half arm spans worth of thread. Because what can tend to happen is, as you as you notice there, it ends up on the floor, can pick up dirt, lint and things like that. And you're pulling it through and you're pulling it all into your into the holes that you're, ma you're making as you're stitching. So it can be a bit of a pain in that sense. Uh, but it also by the end of it can get very the thread can get very fuzzy because it's been through, you know, these little tiny slits hundreds of times. So it starts to wear. So that's something to be aware of. So, you know, when it comes to bags and belts and things like that, I'll tend to go with a, a more manageable arm span of thread and then transition it from one piece to the next seamlessly. Oops, go on there. But uh, another thing about long pieces of thread, it likes to get caught on absolutely everything. <laughs> As uh, you probably no doubt figured out, Tiago. It'd be nice to see this thing finished. I know there's a, a lot of students who are, who are uh, almost completed their version of this bag. So I have a feeling it's going to be quite a popular one because uh, a lot of people have, are already halfway through. It may even be more popular than the Turin luxury handbag, which I know is probably the most popular or at least one of the most popular to date. Uh, courses always go down well. Uh, what usually happens to me is that the thread ends up getting getting knots on. Yeah, yeah. Knotting is a is another issue. Whether linen or polyester thread, it, it can happen. Yeah, it's, it's much easier to go with a manageable length. Yeah, five meters of, of thread in one go. <laughs> Sounds like a little bit of a nightmare. All right, coming up to the gusset now. Oops. And what I'm gonna do is put the weights, pattern weights either side. Sometimes you can put weights inside a bag, which I, I do quite often. If it's a larger bag, uh, you, can put, you can put weights inside that holds it down while you stitch it and makes it quite manageable. But this little one here, 
Um, I wouldn't really want to do that. It'd probably uh, destroy the shape of the gusset, or at least uh, it wouldn't do it any favours. So uh, slow going on this stitch, it's a little delicate. And at 2.7 millimeters or about 10 stitches per inch. So it does take a little while to get around the bag. It's not too, too much trouble. Ah, Jeeves says, greetings from Canada. What part of England uh, are you about? My wife's family is from Nottingham. Ah, Nottingham is a little further north of me. I'm from Kent, which is in the southeast of England. What part of uh, Canada are you from? I lived out there for a period of time, uh, six years actually, in uh, just south of Toronto, in a, in a wonderful luxury part of Canada called Hamilton. Very up market. But no, I love Canada. So stitching onto the gusset now. So we've got several layers of goat skin on this one and reinforcement. It's actually quite smooth to stitch with a sharp awl. Feels like you're stitching toffee, <laughs> strangely enough. Maybe a bizarre example. So uh, some of you might know, but some of you might not. This is a, a welted gusset. Um, basically what a welt is, much like on a Goodyear shoe, there's a, a strip of leather that acts as a go-between between, between two parts. In this case, we've got the uh, the gusset and the exterior of the bag. So what you do is you stitch the gusset onto the strip of leather, the welt, and then you stitch that welt to the bag. So it gives it a, a different look, a bit more of a 3D look, a unique look, I would say, um, but it also makes it a little bit easier to stitch this in, especially this part here, because it gives you some finger room about 20 millimeters to be exact. I have a buddy in Hamilton and worked in Dundas for a period. <laughs> Dundas is actually where I lived. Uh, I lived uh, on York Road, just up from Max uh, Milk. I was right next to the uh, the main park in the middle, you know, where the cemetery is. So that's that's where I was. That's, that's quite bizarre. Incidentally, you've ever seen that film, uh, Catch Me If You Can, with uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. I forget the name of the guy that that was the story that was based on. He was a fugitive from the FBI, but apparently the closest he ever came to being caught was in Max Milk in Dundas, Ontario. Is uh, strange the one next to uh, Tim Hortons. Good old Timmy's missed that double double. Uh, probably about almost a thousand stitches on this perimeter. So it does take a little while. And we have 12 people on the moment. Uh, so anyone who's new into uh, this live, I'm just stitching up the exterior of this small handbag at the moment. Uh, that is what I'm basically what I'm doing today. 
Uh, but if you do have any questions, anything you uh, want to know while I'm here, feel free. Just a bit of a stitching session going on. Just me, myself and all. So this bag on the exterior, is this is a uh, kid skin, glacé kid skin. Uh, I do have a video on my channel uh, all about kid skin, which gives you a little bit more in depth into it. It's one of my favorite skins to work with. Essentially, it's the equivalent to calf skin, but for goat. So a kid is obviously a small goat. So the grain is finer, the skin is uh, a little smaller and thinner. So great for small bags, wallets, things like that. And this happens to be a glacé finish. Glacé is a, essentially just a polish. It's not a, a surface finish or anything that's added to it. It's just literally mechanically polished to give the leather a shine. Great for adding an actual polish to it as well, to giving it a, a bit more, a bit more gloss. Uh, Tego says, how long does it take you to create a pattern? I'm usually the type that grabs a made pattern and then I'll, uh, then I'll after it. How long does it take me to make a pattern for? Uh, it could be a couple of days to, to, to make a, a bag pattern, but you know, even if you've spent that length of time on it, there's always updates and things that you need to kind of adjust on the pattern once you've made it. Uh, so it's really difficult to say. If it's something that's simple and straightforward and the kind of thing that I've done before on a wallet, then uh, it could take me a few hours. Um, yeah, but a bag would be would be quite long. Uh, I recall you had an all, your all modified with a leather loop for your finger, if I'm not wrong, says LG Leatherworks. Uh, yeah, so this is a, a finger loop and that goes on there. I do ha have a video on my um, YouTube channel on how to create this finger loop. Um, it's uh, really good for when you're stitching at the same time. I'll use it on this for a few for a few goes because it's uh, it pivots from the little finger at the back. It works well for short awls. If you have a really long awl, uh, it doesn't work so well. So as I'm as I need to bring it back, I just use my fingers to bring it into play. And then once I want to switch to my needles, I just pull that back and I can actually let go of the awl. I don't need to hold on to it with my little finger or my ring finger, which I do on a on a naked awl essentially, and an awl that doesn't have the the strap, so I can now go from here to here to here to here very, very easily. Whereas if I'm doing it with a regular awl, I have to use the tension. Oh, there you go. <laughs> I have to use the tension from the ring of the little finger to keep it from falling just like that. So uh, great for beginners is something I, I show off in uh, my main courses, the techniques of hand stitching, which is a course available at leathercraftmasterclass.com, link in bio. Uh, so uh, that can help a lot of people, yeah. And I'll show you how to make it. This one happens to be pigskin lined, so it's very nice on the uh, on the finger. Um, but also, it keeps the same angle all the time. That angle never changes as I'm stitching, so uh, it's one less thing to think about. Uh, sm uh, Jeeves says, "Ah, small world and even smaller on the internet. I didn't get to explore much." Uh, but took my wife for an anniversary sunrise to the lookout up on the mountain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think another one you're talking about where you look over Dundas. Yeah, I've been there. Uh, come back and do some live classes. Uh, I'd love to one day. I think there's actually, a, correct me if I'm wrong, there's a, a Leathercraft club in Dundas. I think the guy at Tundra Leather in Hamilton runs it. Could be wrong on that one. 
Uh, I'm brand new to leather work and I'm going to try and do saddle stitch for the first time today. Uh, any tips that aren't in my videos? Um, any tips that aren't in my videos? Yeah, take your time. Expect uh, that it's going to take a little bit of practice. Try not to get frustrated and just accept the fact that it's a, a brand new skill that you're learning. Uh, and try not to put too much pressure on yourself. If it stops becoming fun, take a break. Uh, and don't push yourself or try and force yourself to get it right uh, the first time. It's something that, uh, you know, as a skill is acquired over time. But I do have, which might be helpful for you, uh, the Leathercraft beginner class, which is uh, available on my website. Currently discounted at £27, if that's something you're interested in, which goes on to show you how to uh, perform the stitch but with an easier version than the saddle stitch, first of all, and then working up to and then beyond the saddle stitch. So for those of you interested in doing that, that might be something that can help start your leather crafting journey. But yeah, take your time. Take your time. Put no expectations on to go. It took me a while to get it. I think a lot of people uh, get very frustrated with it because it's, uh, I mean, there's a lot going on. If you count the number of steps, especially if you're using them all, let's count it. So you're going in one, pulling out two, pushing in with the left needle three, coming under for a T four, moving the thread out of the way five, pushing that right needle in six, casting seven, and then Pulling the thread in is step number eight. So it's an eight step process over and over and over again. Um, and if you get any of those wrong in that particular order, the stitch is gonna start looking a little unusual. And uh, yeah, that makes it tough. But just try, try and avoid using uh, learning to stitch on cheap leather, especially soft leathers, couch leathers, chrome tan leathers. You want a good thick piece of veg tan because there's not a lot that can go wrong on that. And if your stitch doesn't look great, it's you, not the leather. Sometimes people try and learn on, on cheap leather, first of all, and think to themselves, okay, when I get good, I'm going to move on to a better quality piece of leather. And it just, you know, never happens. It's a bit like, you know, I'll go on a diet and start the gym when I get in shape. It's, it doesn't really work that way around. So start with something that's going to give you the best platform. And my recommendation is always a good, thick, stiff piece of vegetable tanned leather. And that makes learning so much simpler because it's a lot more consistent and forgiving. You know, soft leathers, uh, you know, similar to these, or especially exotic skins, things like that, you know, are really, really difficult to, uh, to get to grips with if you're trying to learn the stitch at the same time. actually had one of my students, very bold student, tried uh, their first project the other day, which was a, a card holder. And uh, they did it in exotic leather. They did it in alligator. <laughs> they did a really good job, actually. Um, but yeah, it was their first ever project. That must have been, I must have been quite tough to do. Got caught in the hardware there. Where are we? There we are. I'm stuck at my dad's after three spine surgeries. Oh, that sucks. Hope he's looking after you. So I only have soft leather. Any tips on a neat back stitch? Yeah. Um, if you only have soft leather, I mean, have a go. Just don't expect it to, to be any good. Um, you know, you're, you're, because it could be a case of, you know, you're trying to learn how to juggle while surfing on a wave at the same time and you're frustrated because you can't get the juggle. Well, you, you know, you haven't got your feet on flat ground. So a good foundation uh, such as good leather is, is going to make a whole world of difference. So just expect that you're, you're trying to learn on something that is completely unforgiving. Um, but just, just try and have fun with it. 
and play around with it and uh, don't expect it to look too good. And if it does, excellent, well done. Uh, da, 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 da. Nice leather and handle. Thank you very much. Yeah, this is a very different kind of rolled handle. If you have a look on here, you can see that normally on a handle, let me go and get my other bag. Hold on one second. Uh, I'll show you on a regular handle. See so my De Havilland travel bag here. Uh, regular handle, you can see there's a, a seam that sticks out. So it's not completely rounded. So there's your edge, in this case with edge paint on. So this is my daily bag. That's the kind of normal rolled handle you see. This bag that has to be happens to be kicking around. So another one I made. So you can see the seam a little bit more easily there. So that is a kind of a, a traditional bag handle. But on this one, it's completely round, as you can see. So it has a, a very different hold to it uh, and gives it a, what I, you know, the, the idea of this was to make it look like a bamboo piece, even though I'm using uh, exotic leathers. I guess similar in some ways to uh, the handles used by Gucci, they use cane, which is a similar look to bamboo, it heated over a flame and then bent into shape. This has that kind of traditional cane handle effect. You see them on uh, vintage umbrellas and things like that. I kind of find that look quite cool. So I thought I'd try and simulate it the best I can and create a seamless handle, which I've never seen before. Uh, do something new and interesting that people can uh, then use on other projects. Uh, da, 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 da. Is it important to stitch so close to the edge? Um, it really depends on the project that you're creating. I know that's a bit of a cop-out answer, but if you're uh, stitching through very thick leather, you don't really want to get close to the edge so much because um, you can get puckering on the edge you want to keep it a little bit further away but if you're creating a delicate project like a, a you know a very thin card holder or wallet you know a slim one you can get away with going a little bit closer to the edge but you can start compromising strength and also your pricking iron when you're pricking close to the edge can start moving further towards the edge because the less mass you have between your iron and the edge, the more the iron wants to move towards the edge because there's less resistance on that side. So sometimes you need to come in far enough so that it goes straight down. That's actually, um, I did a really good, probably the, one of the most popular blogs, are you making one of these uh, pricking iron mistakes? I think it's like five or seven mistakes I highlight and I give diagrams and images showing you all different kinds of mistakes that you can make with a pricking iron. And one of them is going too close to the edge because then it starts to migrate that way as you're hammering through. So on the front side, your seam might be 2.5 millimeters from the edge. And on the rear side, it's 1.5 millimeters because it's actually moved slightly as you're pricking, which is an inconsistent method as well. Uh, and it gives a really odd look and, and weakens the overall project. So you always want to be mindful and you know, there would be a great rule of thumb, like whatever thickness it is, that should be the distance away from the edge. But it's not, doesn't really work like that. Um, there's no rule of thumb. It's all about testing. For example, um, the thickness on this bag is going to be around eight millimeters, but there's no way I would have the seam coming in about eight millimeters. This is about four millimeters from the edge. So you really, I always encourage people to test everything first on a prototype, make parts of a bag first out of leather and test to see what it looks like, what it feels like, is it strong, is it coming up with problems and get all that done off the design so that when you create it, uh, you end up with the, uh, the perfect formula. Okay, that's not the question you were asking. <laughs> uh, is it important to sit so close to the edge on the handles? Um, yes, okay, going back to handles. Well, 
generally what what you tend to do is you you stitch it with this strip still sticking out perhaps you know one or two centimeters and then you trim up to it okay so there's no stress on the seam um, and you don't want to use your threads to actually pull the leather in putting too much stress on it so you you pre-glue the seam together and bring it in then prick mark it then stitch it and then you trim it um, yeah, you want to you want to have it relatively close, around a couple millimeters away, because otherwise it's, it's too much handle for the hand to hold on to, and it becomes a bit more uncomfortable. Uh, hopefully, that's what you meant. So, coming on to the radius of the bag, or the radius of the gusset, so as I stitch this in, uh, you can see the radius here. So this part. So one little tip I can give you guys is if you imagine that this, um, I'm gonna just tap the screen here so it goes away. Uh, I can't even see what I'm doing because all the text is in the way. But anyway, imagine that this curve here was a complete circle, okay? Like you put a coin in the edge. If you imagine the center of the circle, as you're going around with your all, okay? Your all is going straight on the straight parts. And then as you turn the corner, you want to be aiming the all into the center of that circle and then straight again, like so. So that's something to be mindful of if you are stitching with an awl. So if you're going for a more traditional route with your leather craft and you enjoy using an awl like I do, these are some things that you want to uh, be thinking about. All right. Here's my other piece. So as I'm going around now, I'm going to be moving. And I'm actually moving my physical body around as well. So as I start going around, I'm kind of like changing position and then I'll move the bag around. So you never want to be stitching it awkwardly or putting yourself in an awkward position when you're trying to stitch it at a weird angle. You should always be comfortable when uh, performing leather work, and that doesn't matter whether you're cutting, skiving, sanding, stitching, edge finishing. You always want to keep your body in a comfortable position because it's easier to be more consistent when you're in a comfortable position. You're not changing all the time. You know, I was saying this in a live on uh, Instagram yesterday. Uh, and if you guys enjoy catching my lives, I kind of spread them between Instagram and YouTube. So at Leathercraft Masterclass, uh, at Leathercraft Masterclass on Instagram uh, to make sure that you don't miss any lives. But I was, uh, I was saying uh, stitching is very much like uh, target shooting or archery. You always want to keep the same body position all the time as much as you can, which helps to keep your, your stitching and cutting and everything more consistent. If you're stitching a project and you're, you're uncomfortable and you're having to kind of sit down and then stand up and then change body positions all the time, you're going to see an effect on the neatness and consistency of your stitching. So something to be aware of as well. I'm, I'm doing one thing very consistently here. I'm catching it on the handle. <laughs> Need to be more mindful of that as I'm stitching. This has been a really fun project so far, actually. I'm looking forward to seeing it completed. But I'm also gonna miss making it. <laughs> it's been very therapeutic. Uh, Amanda says, sorry to go back to a really basic question, but do you have any tips for a neat back stitch? Oh, you did ask me that earlier, didn't you? I forgot to miss. I like the tip for following the center of a circle. Thanks. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, any tips for a neat back stitch? You know what? I 
I can tell you, but it's, it's such a visual thing, um, which is why I created video courses on it. But I do have a free video on YouTube, okay, which I'm on right now. So when you've finished, go and have a look. Um, you can go onto my channel and you know there's a little search bar at the top, which is like an out, uh, a magnifying glass, that thing. Click on that and just put in backstitch, one word. And uh, the video that should come up is just a, a quick tutorial on how to perform the back stitch, uh, the front and the rear of the seam. It's going to be much easier for you to watch that than just me explain it, because um, then you can visually see rather than just interpret what I'm what I'm saying. Uh, but if I could say one thing, keep practicing it. It's uh, expect to get it wrong a couple times first. Uh, what's the minimum maximum radius you use on gussets? Do you have any preference? I mean, if you look at uh, a project like the Terrain Luxury Handbag, the radius of that, I mean, it was the gussets were literally a square with the bottom corners very slightly rounded. It's probably a five millimeter radius. So there you go, five millimeters. Um, you know, it's that it really depends on the, on the design and whether it can take a very tight radius. Hi from Slovenia. It says Christian. Hello from the United Kingdom. Thanks, says Amanda. Are oh, you very welcome? Don't forget to like the video. Helps me with the algorithm. <laughs> Greetings from Spain. Greetings from Spain. You know, that's one of the few European countries that I haven't actually been to yet. I know, I'm very bad. Neither Spain nor Portugal. That's uh, which is very much unlike um my uh, fellow countrymen, because Spain and Portugal is like the most common vacation spot for uh, for the English. It's probably why I'm not going there, <laughs> but I need to. I really want to get to Spain. I'm going to be honest, mainly mainly for the food and the wine, <laughs> and the beaches, and yeah, the weather, yeah, and everything else, yeah. I need to get out there. Any recommendations? Where's your favorite spot that you could recommend for me to go when visiting Spain? I'm open to recommendations, guys. So almost halfway onto this gusset now. And this is it. So the next part is uh, some final sanding of the edges, flattening them down, smoothing the edges, and then uh, starting the final edge coat. So I'm using edge finish on this, Uniters, which is my favorite. I can move this a little bit more now. Hi, Philip from Jakarta, Jakarta, Indonesia. Got a lot of people from Jakarta on this live. I think it's like uh, my top. Uh, yeah, I think it's. I think Jakarta is either number one, number two in cities that I am most popular in, which is really cool. Um, oh, we have a super chat from uh, Christian, five euros. Thank you very much. <laughs> I didn't even know that was possible on my channel. I appreciate that very much. Thank you. That'd be, that'd be a first. Uh, you should visit us. We have uh, very good leathers here. Yeah, there are very good leather. Goat leather, I think, is is one of your biggest exports in, in Spain. Could be wrong with that, but I think I think goat's quite popular as a food source. Any country where a particular animal is a, as a popular as a food source ends up being what they're really well known for. Uh, in, in the tanneries. It's, it's amazing how much the diet of a country influences the leather goods that are produced. You know, in the UK, we eat very little goat, very little goat at all. It's rare that you'll see goat in a restaurant. Um, certain West Indian West restaurants will have uh, goat curry and things like that, but in general, it's not, it's not a thing here. So we don't tend to see goat leather unless it's imported from Spain, in uh, France or uh indeed italy um in the uk we eat a lot of beef beef is one of the the most popular things um so you know english bridal leather full-grown cows we don't eat a lot of calf here either so we don't get a lot of calf leather so mainly the the leathers that we produce here are 
bovine based. So yeah, quite interesting, very interesting. Uh, thanks for turning on the camera. You're welcome, Robert. I'm having a morning cup of coffee in Texas watching you stitch. Ah, just finished my afternoon cup of coffee. That's cool. Definitely want to visit Texas one day. That's uh, definitely on my bucket list of places to go. Mainly for the barbecue. <laughs> Probably for the, the, the lifestyle of the people and the barbecue. I've heard it's very good. I'm a big fan of barbecue. Um, I studied... I'm not even going to attempt to butcher that uh, that name. Uh, in Spain for my PhD, and it helped change the laws to protect and boost the Spanish Imperial Eagles populations. Oh, how cool is that? Seville. Uh, he had good oranges there. <laughs> That's really cool. Doniana, I'm going to say that, but it's probably wrong. Uh, sure, I'll write you an email for uh, good spots in Spain. Thank you very much. Yeah, philip at leathercraftmasterclass.com. Uh, I mean, the, the UK too says, Amanda, any recommendations for leather balms? You know, I, th I think overall the easiest one that I could suggest is uh, if you go and have a look at some Saphir products, S A E H I R, it's a French company. Uh, and they make some really high quality. It's mainly for shoe care, but they also do a lot of leather goods. Uh, and I use shoe products on leather goods all the time. Uh, leather is leather. So I always recommend Sophia as being one of the better ones, in my opinion. Rejuvenator is, uh, is a popular uh, balm, basically for cleaning and restoring oils and things like that. If you come to Portugal, says Tiago, don't fall for the trap in the out of the Algarve. No, that's that's like it's just full of British. Apparently, you'll have a, a better time if you go to the mountains for the views. Yeah, that's where I'd go. And if you explore the interior, you'll get fat without going broke. <laughs> that's what we all want, right? I'm here in Austin. Barbecue is totally awesome. I believe it. I believe it. Yeah, I'd probably go for one of the cities like Houston or Austin. That'd be a cool place to go. Jared says, hey there, we exchanged once via email. Uh, I am an inventor, engineer type person. Has anyone commissioned you for something that was James Bond-like or, <laughs> or wildest Swiss army leather prototype? Um, I can honestly say I don't think so. Um, yeah, Swiss army, no. Um, I mean, I got asked and have been asked couple times now to do uh, dispatch boxes in the UK. Um, but nothing real James Bondy. I guess it would be more political than anything. Um, I have to leave, says Angel. See you later. And thank you for the good work. No problem at all. Thank you for stopping by. Amanda says, thanks. I was looking at them yesterday. Yeah. Uh, they cost a little bit more than average, but a little goes a long way. And they're, they're just very reliable in what they do. You can't really go wrong with Sophia products. Yeah, I use some of their products for uh, my shoes as well. But uh, I also use some of them for uh, conditioning, conditioning leathers, cleaning leathers, things like that. Because realistically, if you're restoring leather goods, you always want to, or you're trying to clean them, you always want to clean first, then replace the oils, and then, you know, a wax top coat of some kind just to give, give it a little bit more protection, water resistance. I mean, that's what I did with this. I usually uh, clean and uh, rejuvenate leather before I actually start cutting in. So I did with this skin that I used here. Uh, I can't remember what I used to rejuvenate. I think I used Maison, Maison Boran, which is a French company, to give it a top coat. It's a, a mixture with uh, canorba wax in it, which is a very firm wax, but gives a really nice polish. So a couple layers on there, and when I finish the bag, it will take a nice, nice, good polish. 
It also uh, protects the leather over time. Jared says, uh, glad you laughed. Uh, this is how I think. What was that box? The dispatch box is, um, it's used in politics and for the royal family as well. It's a box that the, I think the Chancellor of the Exchequer uses for the documents for the budget in the UK. Um, but the, I believe the Queen and now the King also has one uh, for the documents that need signing. It's like an official, it's like a similar to an attache case, uh, but it's made of, uh, it's a, a wooden box with a goat skin covering on it. Um, so it's similar to an attache case in, in that sense. If you just put in dispatch box and you'll see a little bit more about it. But uh, yeah, I no longer take on commission work because obviously I, I just don't have the time these days for that kind of thing. Uh, I usually, because I'm so kind, <laughs> I usually pass on um, commission work to my students. So I, I have a selection of uh, students who produce particularly good quality work uh, and uh, I usually take requests and uh, move them on to some of my students. Uh, so it's a win-win for everybody, everyone's happy. Uh, use a mixture of wax like that on wood. Oh, that's interesting. I never thought of using canova wax on wood, but I guess, yeah, why not? Absolutely, why not? Yeah, I like using a mixture of uh, boiled linseed oil and uh, beeswax on wood. Do occasionally work with wood. I did a, actually did a when I was younger, two year apprenticeship in uh, carpentry and joinery. When I was very young, sixteen years old. Um, so I, I do like working a little bit with wood. In fact, there is uh, if anyone's was interested in doing a, a project, this is a, a strop that I made. I actually use China wood oil on this. This is black walnut. Uh, this is the strop that I use for sharpening my tools. So on one side I have a uh, green compound. So that gives a nice polish. And this is a canvas side with a secret ingredient on there. If you're interested in, in watching this, there is a, a YouTube video that I have. I actually have two strops uh, on YouTube that I created. Uh, one's the smaller one, which is the tabletop strop. Okay, because it, grip, it grips the table and doesn't move around when you press it down. But this is the, the large paddle strop. Uh, so if you want to learn how to make that, I'll show you exactly how I did it. So if you're into a, a little bit more, you know, woodworking, that kind of thing, go and check that out. That might be something you're interested in. It's a great leathercraft project. And once you've made it, it encourages you to uh, remember to keep your tools sharp, which is vitally important in this craft. Uh, Nicholas, hello Nicholas, uh, he says, good afternoon, have you made anything with American English bridal leather? If so, what might you compare it to in the Euro market? No, I haven't. I, I, I don't think it's imported into the UK. If you're talking about, you know, Wicket and Craig, English bridal, stuff like that. From what I can see and what I've heard, it's it's very good. Um, it's going to be a, it's not exactly the same. I don't think it has the same uh, tallow content as a more traditional bridal leather, but uh, it's, it's going to be a, a general high quality veg town with some kind of wax and fat stuffing into it. But uh, no, I haven't been able to compare it. I'd love to, but I, I don't even have any samples. Uh, who else makes it? I think Horween might have something similar. I don't know if they call it English bridal though. Uh, Jared says, also, uh, could you speak, if you could speak every language, <laughs> what's a white whale tome 
of information on Victorian leatherwork that if a genie granted <laughs> that it would be translated into English for you to read. Um, I would like that comment translated into English for me to read first, <laughs> first of all, Jared. <laughs> um, Uh, if, if I can understand what you're asking correctly, what, what language? Um, I mean, other than England, France uh, and Germany probably have the, the oldest traditions of, of leatherwork as we know it today. So probably either be French or German. But if you're talking about another language in the Victorian era, uh, English is barely readable at that point. So uh, I can imagine it would be a very old Germanic language or French language, probably different from uh, today's. <laughs> All right, so coming up to the second radius now. I think this thread is longer than it needs to be, which is a better way of doing it. Still catching a little bit on there. So we're coming into the radius again. So as I mentioned before, the second time, I'm going to be changing the angle of the awl from stitch to stitch and making sure that I am aiming the awl at the center of the radius around the base of the gusset. So as I'm going around, I'm kind of changing that angle as I go. So slow stitching this. It's not an easy one to stitch fast. Limited room with my left hand. Uh, but also this thing moves around quite a lot, so you've got to be really careful not to disturb it. So we're making good headway. Now, instead of turning my body, I'm going to turn a project. Yeah, it's all good, says Jared. Pure curiosity, I like a vibe. Taught myself uh, welding by trial and error. About to spot weld the batteries. That's pretty cool. Uh, Amanda says, linseed oil is my favorite, but using some exotic woods, you can't use oil as they are already oily. Yeah, I guess. We'll check out the strop video, thanks. Yeah, no problem at all. Yeah, what's a really oily wood? I remember now. Well, some are really uh, resinous, aren't they? They don't really take uh, oils very well. I'm thinking Os Osage or Osage orange. It's quite it's supposed to be quite oily. Very good for bow making. I could be wrong on that. Jared says, my bad, I do that sometimes. Tiago says, take your time. It's great talking to you. <laughs> Thank you, Tiago. Great talking to you too. It's nice to have a little company in the workshop. Makes it a bit nicer, nicer experience. Now, occasionally, it's nice to have your thoughts to yourself. And then sometimes it's nice to have a, a little company in the workshop. So coming around that radius now so I can start straightening out my awl so that I'm pushing it through the leather perpendicular to the surface. So 
So it's the home straight, guys. The home straight. I hope you're all as excited as I am on the edges of your seats. The last part, the last few stitches, and then that's it. And uh, and then I could be installing the hardware. I don't know if uh, anyone's seen this hardware. This is um, from Wuta Leather, so it's not um, a traditional lock or anything like that. I did actually put a lock on um, the mini doctor's bag, which is another course that I did with like a traditional doctor's bag, but like literally this size, like a mini version uh, to use as a lady's handbag. I had, did a lock on that one with a key and a clochette and everything like that. But on this particular one, I'm using a, a very simple uh, closure, which pulls out, I don't know if you can see that, and undoes on this particular part here. So you just literally pull it and it comes away, but it's actually really nice. And the the all the hardware on this particular bag, from the D-rings to the lock, to the chain that's gonna be uh, used because it's a crossbody bag, um, even the uh, little, uh, I'll call them lobster clips. Uh, all of those are solid stainless steel, which is quite difficult to get all the hardware. There's certainly not one manufacturer that does it all, unfortunately, but uh, managed to get everything stainless steel on here. And I much prefer, if you're going to go silver hardware, solid stainless steel, because if it gets scratched or scuffed, it's still stainless steel underneath, unlike uh, other metals that might be gold-plated brass or... You know, some that I've, even I've used in the past because it's just so difficult to get something that's solid. Um, so this is all solid stainless. Do, 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 do you know the name of the book you have in your mind's eye? Can you get out of my mind's eye? <laughs> uh, do I, no, I, just, I mean, I haven't gone looking for uh, any German uh, leather, Victorian leathercraft manuals. Personally, I wouldn't know where to look. I'm sure they must exist. I might actually look now, but uh, no, I don't. Um, unfortunately, neither French either. Cocobalo is oily. It will burnish itself practically. Beautiful though. Oh yeah, Cocobalo is, is very nice. Um, has a nice figure to it, doesn't it? Tago so says, are you going to pick up your podcast, the original format, and uh, make the interviews you were thinking of making. Um, I say you've been following me a long time. Uh, you know, I I did go through a, a quite a few months of doing a question and answer session. So I'd, I would get questions off Instagram uh, that people really wanted to, to know about. And then I would do a Q&A session on the camera on YouTube. And then I would take the audio and use that as a podcast. So I guess repurposing it in, in that sense. Um, but I've kind of slowed down a little bit on that so that a little bit more time can go by. And then I'll, I'm going to be bringing that back once the questions get a little bit more juicy. Because I, after a while, I was kind of answering all the questions that were coming through. So people would ask me, oh, can you include this in your next Q&A session? And I'd be like, uh, you know, go and check February's Q and A. That's that's where I answered that question in depth. So um, it's difficult to have absolute brand new questions every time. So I do intend on picking that back up, which will also mean the podcast will be going. Um, I'm going to be completely honest with you. It's uh, a lot of people I was asking. I mean, I created the first Leathercraft podcast in existence. At that point, there was 500,000 podcasts in the world. And not one had anything to do with leather craft at all. There were leather crafters like saddlers being interviewed on a craft podcast, but there wasn't anything at all. And then after a few episodes, um, a couple of other people started up. Uh, it was very difficult in the beginning. I mean, I haven't tried it again, but I just couldn't convince or nail down anybody to get on a podcast, I guess, because it was such a, a foreign idea at that point, And no, no one in the leather craft community had, had done it. Um, so to get people on it was very difficult, but I much, well, I found it much easier to get people to agree to a blog interview. So, I mean, I have a, an interview with an ex Hermes craftswoman who's um, currently working out of uh, San Francisco, uh, April in Paris, and uh, I interviewed her, interviewed uh, Atelier Dixon. Uh, ex John Lobb shoemaker, 
which is a, a high-end shoemaker in, in London, bespoke shoes, that kind of thing, starting at around £4,000 and up for a basic shoe. So I did interviews on there and uh, I found people a lot more agreeable for that kind of thing, but uh, def definitely difficult to nail people down that were willing to do it, but it's, it takes up a lot of time doing them. Uh, so I have to think, you know, what, how can I best serve the leathercraft community? Is it through spending my time trying to get people nailed down onto blogs and things like that? Or is it better to do a more visual format, creating uh, video and content for Instagram and YouTube that people actually see? And since it's such a, a visual craft, uh, I feel that what I'm doing now is, is probably helping more people uh, than doing a podcast interview or just podcast in general. So I'd like to pick it back up. If there were, if there were two of me, that would be absolutely ideal. But uh, sometimes when you refocus on something like the podcast, everything else takes a, a bit of a back seat. So it could be a very delicate balance to, to, uh, to get it right. Uh, to be honest, I really preferred the original podcast before the Q and A. Yeah, that's the thing that I can I can take the audio off a Q and A and upload it, and it's cost me hardly any time. And uh, a lot of people absolutely love it. They'll listen to the Q and A on the way to work or when they're in the gym. The original format would would literally take a, a full day, uh, anywhere up to two days, uh, to complete. So it's. Um, Not ideal, unfortunately. I would put your podcast on while I was working. <laughs> Lob is the shoe one must have before dying. Yeah, I mean, I'd love to have a Lob shoe, John Lob shoe. I mean, I I, I do enjoy handmade shoes. I have a, a couple of shoe pairs of boots. I'm not a shoe guy, I'm a boot guy. I don't even own a shoe. Um, handmade in England, but nothing to the level of, of uh, John Lobb, which I'd love, to, I'd love to have a Lobb pair of shoes. You know, having something made uh, bespoke to your foot. And it's not like a bespoke suit. If you put on weight or lose weight, <laughs> it doesn't fit you anymore. Your feet kind of stay the same mostly throughout the years, mostly. So, uh, yeah, I'd love to have, uh, I don't know, a pair of uh, a monk strap boots would be quite nice, or a pair of uh, Chelsea's would be, yeah, would be my, my kind of thing. Just love the, the traditional craft of, of it being handmade and, and a lot of it, the sole, hand-stitched onto the upper. Still with uh, traditional linen threads, waxed with uh, what you call code, which is a mixture of um, beeswax and pine resin. Uh, Jared says, uh, you might have someone that can guide you. I like a challenge, things that come easy to me. I design on the fly and learn easy. I make making things out of leather and wanted to learn a third language. Get me the name. I'll email you next Thursday. If I can translate it, I'll give you a translated copy. Yeah, sure. I mean, if you've, if you've got something interesting uh, like that, I'd be more than happy to... Uh, to take a look. I do like the old uh, the old vintage leather craft books, catalogues. And uh, I got one the other day, I think it was by a company called Garston, which is no longer in existence, but they made uh, a lot of uh, tache cases, handbags, trunks, things like that. And I managed to get an HD copy of, uh, of their catalog, which is quite interesting. I think it's from the early 1900s. It's always uh, uh, inspirational to uh, take a look at that. Oh, 
almost at the end here. And I can show you guys uh, the look of the bag. How long have I been live for? I've been live for one hour and five minutes. Goodness me. Well, at least that answers the question, does uh, YouTube go on for over an hour, unlike Instagram, which just shuts you off without warning? Actually, it gives you a 10 second countdown. And hopefully you're looking up during that time. Uh, but yeah, so we can, we can carry on. This is some good content, right? <laughs> So, heard about uh, half a dozen stitches to go. And this at the very end. So like four more. <laughs> Three. Two. Five. <laughs> Last one, here we go. Re-go through that, make sure we've got enough space for the all. There we go. So I can stick the all down now. Last stitch, so a couple of back stitches now. Let's double check. Back stitch. I'm also going to give it a double cast. So, you know, on the thick leather, as long as the leather's not too thin, usually what I like to do is uh, on my last one, just uh, double cast the thread, which means wrapping it over the needle twice. So that's, that's a reinforced overhand knot, essentially. And just as I pull it in, leaving a little bit of exposed thread and add just a touch of uh, PVA glue or white glue, or Elmer's glue as it's probably called in the, the US, which is now in the UK. I've seen it in the stores, Elmer's glue. So now I've got glue on the thread in the knot and as I pull it in tight, it kind of pulls all that inside. It gives a very, very strong knot. If ever you need to undo it for whatever reason, you'll, you'll get to see how much uh, strength just that alone has so let's nip this and I'll be going around it with a pair of edging pliers as well uh, Nicholas says a very active hour thank you for your time and patience answering our questions you're very welcome Nicholas um, Yeah, find out the name and the language of whichever book. It might take me a year or so, but I'm serious. You can translate it. <laughs> so cool. All right. Sometimes you get little tiny bits of uh, uh, wax from the, uh, the wax linen thread. Make sure you get that out, especially before doing any edge finishing. So this is what we're looking at at the moment, sans hardware and edge finishing. That's the way the bag will be closing. So you can see the gusset is actually set back on the inside with the welt there. And as the bag closes, that gets compressed and comes in. And this little part here, which is where we attach our shoulder strap, comes out and gets exposed. Uh, for usage and it also keeps the closure, which is this part here, away from rubbing this edge. So you want to make sure it comes out very slightly so it keeps it away from that. So edge finishing is coming up next. 
and then we'll be adding our hardware and that will be the bag complete and it will look a lot better by then hopefully uh, hopefully of course it will we know it will all right guys thank you so much for joining me i mean it's been a really great conversation with you guys asking some really good questions too which is uh, encouraging to see um and plenty of questions which is always good so keep an eye out make sure you have you know your subscribed and your notifications on because i don't actually come out and you know say hi guys i'm going live in an hour it's more of a spontaneous thing so if you have your notifications on and you don't want to miss you know there could be a little tip in this live which could completely change your leather craft forever you know there's all these little tidbits that come out that you can just really really help you for free essentially it's always good to have your notifications on so that you know when i've gone live and you won't miss a thing at all so uh some of these lives i'll actually keep uh this one i'm gonna let it go up but uh sometimes uh, i just delete the live immediately afterwards so it really depends so make sure you don't miss out because that would be a tragedy if you did so notifications on after subscribing good boys and girls and i'll see you in the next live cheers guys have a great day